respecting and practicing it in the local context. Our role as a committee is to help state parties find a better way how to implement their obligations. The most, the most essential part of implementation is at the national level, and it should be bottom-up and from within. The adoption of laws and policies in and of themselves do not necessarily equate impact. We need to go into details to consider what is actually happening on the ground through to assess whether all the laws, policies, and practices are determined by using the best interest principle. This is what the Child Rights Impact Assessment Framework is a tool to help the government do this. It is an interesting experience for me here to see how Hong Kong is trying to build this up in this local context to make the principle of best interest of the child real and practical. In this regard, I'm um, interested in the potential role of the newly established Commission on Children in Hong Kong could play as multi-stakeholder multi platform for coordination and monitoring of the implementation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child in the local context in Hong Kong. I think today's conference is so timely and so relevant at this juncture, bringing all the relevant people from the government, service sectors, professions, academia, civil society, youth, and general public. I remember the similar positive energy I saw in the second Children's Issues Forum held in 2012. At that time, it was held uh, in Laysan Hauan Theater of the University of Hong Kong, where I was invited as an international speaker. Recalling the enthusiasm toward the establishment of a children's commission I observed at this forum, I'm so grateful to be here being part of this important conference today, this time as a member of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child. At this critical moment for children in Hong Kong that the Commission on Children was established. I'd like to conclude my speech by emphasizing this point again. Implementation at the national and local levels involving all people, all people is the only way, only way to make the respect and protection of the rights of the child reality. Each one of us has a role to play and responsibility because it is the commitment of the global society to all the children in the world. And also, I think it is because protecting rights of the children is for creating and sustaining peace in the world. I thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Otani. Please remain on stage. And uh, thank you. I hope you're OK. I'm OK. I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, here. Please take a seat. Uh, now we'll have our moderators for this session, Professor Kapai and Ms. Block, to come to the stage. Ms. Block is a human rights advisor with Plan International's United Nations office in Geneva where she advocates for children's and girls' rights at the UN Human Rights Council, its special procedures, and the treaty monitoring bodies. Professor Kapai and Ms. Block, please. Thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction, and particularly for Mikiko's speech. Um, it really was a great overview of the legal framework that exists, and I love your reiterations on how children's rights can help bring well, sustainable and peaceful societies, of course, as well. So thank you for that. Um, we just wanted to raise a couple of questions and probe a little bit further, perhaps, um, 
about the role that um, a children's commission could play. You, you mentioned, you touched upon it in your speech, but um, in your opinion, could you perhaps expand a little bit further on what role this commission could play, particularly to safeguard the best interest of the child? Thank you for the questions. And um, I uh, participated in a very uh, interesting and interactive workshop yesterday. And uh, there was a lot of discussion about the um, draft framework uh, for the uh, child uh, children impact, rights impact assessment. And um, when I saw uh, the announcement of the establishment of the uh, Commission on Children in Hong Kong, I, uh, what I found is very um, interesting and positive element is the many people on the non-official members uh, seem to come from every corner of the society. And uh, um, yesterday, uh, one of the points we discussed a lot was the intersectionality of every children's issues. And we know, uh, as a lawyer, we know, I know very well, um, based on my own experience, even we uh, talk about one child issue or the children as group, we as a profession have their, our own each some sort of culture or the terminology, how to uh, use the language and what kind of code of conduct. So uh, even among the professionals uh, who uh, want to uh, work for the children, still sometimes uh, difficulties uh, in finding the common ground. Of course, the common ground should be the um, rights of the child, but still, um, when we discuss, uh, we see the challenge. So I think the, um, the potential of the Commission on Children is such a wide representation uh, from various professions and um, sectors, academia, and I also saw the youth representative. So as I mentioned in my um, speech, it can be a good multi-dimensional, multi-cross-sector platform for the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Makiko, as well, for your call to action across all sectors. That's exactly what we're trying to encourage here. And um, on that, I mean, I wanted to probe further, uh, given your role in working with civil society in Japan, Hong Kong government often looks more regularly at our sort of regional neighbors because of cultural sort of um, parallels. So what role do you think um, civil society can play and has played as sort of successful instigators for change uh, to battle sort of the resistance that culture brings? And by culture, I don't necessarily mean a, you know, a sort of the oriental culture. I'm talking about institutional culture, cultures of governance, sort of across the board, what are some of the best practices to ensure that um, civil societies can hold government trans uh, accountable and transparent? Uh, thank you for this very interesting questions. Um, and uh, I uh, uh, had the opportunity to touch upon this issue in another occasion. From the uh, committee point of view, uh, the reporting procedure uh, we conduct, and this is actually the main uh, work for the committee, this is a sort of bilateral uh, dialogue, bilateral meaning between the committee, 18 members of the committee, and the uh, representative of the government, government delegations. And of course, um, civil societies and academia uh, can come and observe. And uh, these days, uh, it is also broadcast uh, through UNTV. So even you can see uh, without coming to Geneva. but. Because this is the review of the country situation, uh, we are so much, of course, uh, naturally, focusing on the situation of this country. However, um, from the government point of view, uh, maybe uh, if the governments are very serious to prepare for the reporting procedures, they can see uh, the other countries' um, dialogue but um, I don't think um, they do so often. So they may think that uh, these issues like, um, for example, the resistance in the society against some norms or the 
acceptance that the children are the subject and uh, holder of the human rights mm -hmm. might be um, the problem in my country. But from the committee point of view, it is almost always all there. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, during the six hour uh, dialogue with the um, country, we cannot um, tell the country, tell those state parties that uh, in other countries uh, this is also happening, or mm -hmm. what are the best practices. So the, there is a limit um, in the reporting procedures to go beyond this country's situation, and this is where the civil society can play a lot of role. And I think um, in uh, Asia, uh, all Asia, and also the. Um, Northeast Asia and sub-regional situations, we can share more and um, uh, interact more uh, among civil societies and, uh, and learning from the other practices and uh, common challenges and bring back uh, to the country and engage the government to share what we learn from the civil society um, colleagues uh, from other neighboring countries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sure we have a little bit, we have time for one more question, and I'm sure maybe someone from the audience um, would love to ask Mikiko a question. So I see already one, one hand being raised, perhaps. I don't know if they're roving mics. Oh, OK. We're just going to get a mic to you. And, um, and please introduce yourself, state your name and affiliation. And um, thank, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm Rachel Cartland. I was a civil servant, and I'm on the board of the Women's Foundation here. I'd just like to ask the panel something rather specific. Can you point to a particular country or territory that you feel does really well in safeguarding children's rights and ensuring that children have a safe and happy childhood? And can you say what you think the most significant factors are in ensuring that? Is it the culture of the country? Is it because it's a wealthy country? Um, yeah, what, what is it that makes the difference? Thank you uh, for the very um, pertinent and um, difficult uh, question to answer, honestly speaking. And uh, I think um, I cannot uh, answer to your question by naming certain specific countries, but I think your question is really hit uh, the very important topic today, how to assess the impact. Because uh, we, of course, always ask if the principles and pre provisions of the convention are incorporated in the domestic law, and what are the action plans and if those laws and practices are actually practiced, if there is a consistency in the practice throughout the country. All those questions we always ask. But what we don't know, the real impact, it's sort of missing. Of course, we ask the data uh, from the state parties, but still, how to measure uh, the real impact, positive impact, from the data, using the data. So I think this is the uh, challenge uh, for all the state parties, but also for the committee, uh, what kind of tool we, are, we should actually uh, use. So there is a discussion about indicators, uh, how to assess uh, the impact. But um, um, one, it's not maybe uh, the decisive factor, but um, I can. Uh, mention something. One is um, open uh, discussion within the country involving all the sectors and the civil society and children themselves. This is a sort of a starting point in my view. And uh, when they come to the committee, they also open up uh, to share their challenges with us. We are not perfect as a committee. We cannot help all the situations. But maybe, um, based on the information uh, we saw from other countries, maybe we can say something or we can suggest. But again, uh, we have a limitation. So I, I really um, 
interested in how the Hong Kong would develop uh, your framework and uh, test this framework uh, in the Hong Kong situation. And I really want to see uh, if it would really work. Uh, we can share, not as a committee, but you can share. And um, I really want uh, you come to Geneva and uh, brief us. Uh, look, uh, this is the kind of tool uh, we used in Hong Kong and worked well and uh, introduced uh, to other countries. I really hope so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mikiko. Um, I'm afraid we, we don't have any more time for further questions, but I really want to indeed, I, I think your message is really clear. CRC implementation is, um, is at the national level and from the bottom up and within, as you mentioned, um, and I think that really speaks to today's conference and today's discussions. And how do we do that? How do we translate those great standards in, into local practices? And we'll continue having that conversation um, with our next um, plenary speakers. So I don't know who, who does what, but. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Otani, Professor Kapai, and Ms. Block. So um, for those who still have questions for our uh, guests, we do have an open discussion uh, session later on. So um, we can do that later. But now we will have our first plenary session titled Protecting Children and Punishing Offenders, Strengthening the Criminal Law. So may I invite um, our moderator for the next session, Ms. Block, to introduce our speaker for us. Ms. Block, please. It's really my great honor to introduce our uh, next distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Ian Grinville Cross. Uh, Mr. Cross is an honorary consultant to the Child Protection Institute of Against Child Abuse. He's also the vice chairman of the International Association of Prosecutors and chairs its standing committee on prosecutors in difficulty. He served as a director of pu public prosecutions from 1997 to 2009, and uh, was a de deputy director before that from 1990 to 1997. Um, he was appointed Queen's Counsel in 1990 and became senior counsel in 1997. He is an honorary professor of law at this university, at the Hong Kong University, at the University of Hong Kong, and a visiting professor of law at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He has chaired the Committee on the Evidence of Children in Criminal Proceedings. Um, and in 2010, he was awarded the Silver Bohemia Star for Service to Public Prosecutions in Hong Kong. Um, drawing upon his very impressive career, uh, Professor Cross will identify some remaining children's rights issues in Hong Kong and highlight what may be needed um, to strengthen criminal law to help better protect children and punish offenders. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Cross. Mr. Weir, Professor Garpai, distinguished guests, ladies uh, and gentlemen, I'm delighted to have been invited to participate uh, in this conference with its uh, focus on child welfare and rights. Uh, many people have involved in seeking to uh, further the interests of children are participating in today's conference, uh, and the organizers, I think, should be commended uh, on their initiative in bringing everyone together. Now, as has been mentioned, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, the UNCRC, has applied to Hong Kong uh, since uh, 1994, and hopefully the conference today uh, will help to identify the ways uh, in which those rights can be fully achieved, for much uh, still needs to be done. Now, the Commission uh, on sorry, you missed one. <laughs> the, the Commission on Children, as has been mentioned, the Commission on Children was created on, on the first of July, uh, June of this year, and this was certainly a welcome development and was something for which many people who are here today uh, have advocated for many years. Uh, 
Although it doesn't meet everyone's hopes, given that it is not statutorily independent, it nonetheless needs to be given a chance. The chairman of Sir Matthew Cheung, Ken Chung, the Chief Secretary for Administration, uh, and the deputy chairman is Lord Chi Kong, the, Chief, the, uh, the Secretary for Labour and Welfare. Uh, and there are two ways of looking at this. One view is that by having senior governmental figures uh, in the top jobs, the Commission will have the clout which is necessary uh, in order to get things done, as it will mean that when it says something, the administration will listen. The alternative view, however, uh, is that the government wishes to ensure that the Commission behaves itself and does not rock the boat, and the best way of achieving this is by ensuring that it is controlled by government officials. But we must all hope that the former view uh, is the correct one, uh, although we should know very soon. However, whatever our misgivings, the Commission, as I say, needs to be given the opportunity to show its worth, uh, although time, I suggest, is not on its side. Quite apart from monitoring the implementation of the UNCRC, its tasks include researching and analysing data and advising the government uh, of areas requiring action, ensuring child impact studies uh, are conducted as part of the process for legislative change, encourage effecting coordina effective coordination between the various bureau uh, and the non-governmental child groups, promoting campaigns to publicise areas of concern, and where child rights are being violated, making the case for change, uh, including the criminal law, which is the area I propose to discuss today. Now, although the UNCRC makes clear that children are entitled to protection from all forms of violence and hurt, whether physical or mental, the sad reality is that in many cases, in many areas, the criminal law is simply not protecting children uh, as it should, and the Commission must highlight this uh, and seek change. Now, the criminal justice system uh, comprises two parts, the procedural part uh, and the legal part. Now, in the 1990s, uh, the procedural aspects of, uh, of child evidence in uh, Hong Kong were modernised, uh, and the legal system has been able, over the last 25 years or so, to far better serve child victims and witnesses. Uh, until those reforms took place, child victims could only give unsworn evidence in criminal cases, and this had to be corroborated by other evidence before it could be relied upon. And they had to confront their abusers in open court, which was obviously uh, a traumatic experience for them, uh, and often resulted uh, in acquittals after the, ch after the child victims became tongue-tied uh, and confused. Fortunately, as a result of the changes, that, uh, that uh, state of affairs has, uh, has, has changed, and the unsworn evidence of a child can now be acted upon uh, by courts, uh, and their primary evidence can be recorded pri uh, prior to the trial uh, and acted upon by, by juries. The child witnesses can also be cross-examined by means of a live television link from an adjoining room, uh, and they no longer have to confront the, uh, the uh, defendant uh, in open court. Now, however, however, these uh, excellent changes to the criminal justice system's procedures have not unfortunately been matched by corresponding changes uh, to the criminal law. The result being that in many areas the criminal law is no longer fit for purpose uh, and is unable to protect the children. And as he is now the champion of children's rights, we must hope that in the very near future to hear a roar from Mr Matthew Churn as he demands new measures to strengthen the criminal law. Let me turn, first of all, to child psychological abuse. Now, the Commission should start by examining the horrors of child, sexual, uh, child psychological abuse uh, in Hong Kong, which is a, a big problem uh, in Hong Kong's dense environment, where many people live in crowded apartments uh, and tempers are often frayed, particularly in the summer heat. The Social Welfare Department uh, reported 882 cases of child abuse in, two, in uh, 2016, 947 uh, in 2017, uh, and they just reported yesterday that there have been 554 uh, complaints uh, in the first uh, six months of this year. About 50% of those involved uh, physical abuse, about 26% uh, involved uh, sexual abuse, and about 23% involved uh, neglect, which would include, I imagine, uh, psychological uh, and uh, emotional harm cases. Now, alarming as these figures are, they are, of course, only the tip of the iceberg, as many cases go undetected, uh, particularly where they involve mental uh, or verbal abuse. 
Of course, if a child sustains uh, a physical injury, such as a cut or a bruise, there is tangible evidence to support uh, an investigation. But mental damage or suffering is quite different, uh, and there is no hard evidence uh, for prosecution. Now, in the United Kingdom, the Serious uh, Crime Act was uh, enacted in 2016, uh, and this strengthened uh, Britain's child cruelty law and sought to address the problem that I've just described. This new law, which was known as the Cinderella Law, treats sustained emotional abuse, which causes psychological harm to the child, as a crime. Britain's criminal law therefore recognises the need to protect children from sustained emotional abuse, and Hong Kong's criminal law, which of course is based on the British law, must follow suit, as it uh, currently uh, fails to catch various times, types of emotional uh, abuse uh, and neglect. These include frightening or bullying a child, ignoring, isolating or scapegoating a child, or else deliberately denying a child the love and affection that is required for its proper development. Hong Kong's, child, uh, ch Hong Kong's colonial era child cruelty law is simply not designed to cover child psychological abuse. An updated law is therefore required which specifies that willful cruelty likely to cause psychological harm or suffering is a criminal act, uh, and that a carer who causes unnecessary suffering or injury to a child is liable to prosecution, regardless uh, of whether the suffering um, uh, involves physical or psychological uh, injury. The government has hitherto disregarded calls for Hong Kong to have its own Cinderella law, but once Mr. Cheung uh, and his commission make the uh, case uh, to have one, uh, the government will hopefully respond. Now the next area involves the causing or allowing the death of a child, uh, and child suffering is of course uh, always tragic, uh, but the death uh, in, 19, in 2013 of Yung Chi Wai horrified even hardened observers. Uh, as some of you will recall, in 2016, a coroner found that Chi Wai, who was a five-year-old boy who suffered from Down syndrome uh, and had a mental age of 18 months, had died from misadventure uh, while in the care of his drug-dependent mother uh, and her boyfriend, both of whom regularly uh, imbibed the drug ice. Chi Wai was found to have a very high level of ice in his system and probably poisoned himself by swallowing uh, a piece of it that he found lying around uh, in his home. Now, although the police investigated, uh, Chi Wai's carers could not be prosecuted due to deficiencies in the criminal law, uh, including the fact that no drugs or paraphernalia uh, were located at his home when they conducted a search. Uh, and Chi Wai's uh, tragedy was by no means unique, uh, and the Hong Kong Committee on Children's Rights has revealed that at least 11 other children have also suffered abuse, neglect and injury in recent times because of substance abuse by parents uh, or carers. Now to cover this type of situation, the United Kingdom uh, in 2004 introduced a new offence punishable with 14 years imprisonment for anyone who causes the death of a, a child, or should have known that the child was at, at significant risk, but failed to take reasonable steps to prevent the threat harm to the child. And it is no defence that a carer uh, turned a blind eye to the, the child's situation or could not be bothered to check whether the child was all right. Now, in, in uh, September 2006, exactly uh, 12 years ago, our own Law Reform Commission uh, was asked to consider whether Hong Kong should also have a similar law but 12 years on, it still has not come up with any recommendations, which is extraordinary. Even when the report finally appears, remember, it will still have to undergo a lengthy consultation process, which means that any legislation is still light years away. I would expect Mr. Cheung, as Commission Chairman, to pursue this delay with the Secretary for Justice, who chairs the Law Reform Commission, as a matter of urgency, given that there is a clear lacuna uh, in the criminal law which must be plugged. Uh, he may, however, simply have to uh, place a, a bomb under the Law Reform Commission, which is notorious for its delays. Now, this should have been a simple exercise, perhaps lasting one to two years, and a delay of 12 years uh, is clearly intolerable, uh, given the vulnerability of so many children uh, in Hong Kong. Let me turn now to uh, online dangers to, to children. In recent years, children have faced... Uh, new types of threats, obviously, uh, and I'll examine two of those today because of time constraints, namely access to online pornography uh, and internet grooming. Uh, had I had more time, I would have uh, told you about the cyber bullying more generally, 
because the scale, the scale of cyberbullying uh, among school children has been exposed by the Polytechnic University in the, last, in the past week, together with deficiencies uh, in our law. Also, online child sexual exploitation through the use of child uh, sexual uh, abuse images is of huge concern to enforcers everywhere, and this is another phenomenon which requires close scrutiny. However, the first concern I want to address specifically uh, is the availability of harmful online pornography, which is available to anyone with a computer, regardless of age. Although the scale of the problem here in Hong Kong is uncertain, research by the Children's Commissioner in England has shown that the majority of children are exposed to pornography by their early teens. Uh, Britain's National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children says an entire generation of children risks being, quote, stripped of their childhoods. It is far too easy for children, whether inadvertently, uh, through curiosity, uh, or, or as a result of peer pressure, to visit adult websites. And the effects of what they see can be devastating, involving emotional disturbance uh, and psychological damage. Access to internet pornography, therefore, must be strictly controlled, which of course is what happens in the offline world already, uh, which means checking uh, those who are seeking access to it. In the United Kingdom, the Digital Economy Act was uh, enacted just last year, uh, and since April of this year, uh, on, all online pornography content is controlled by mandatory age verification to protect children from adult material. Online providers are now required to ensure that their adult websites are not accessible to under-18s, and a regulator polices the websites. If a pornographic website does not have age ver verification measures in place, it is liable to uh, a, a fine of 250 British pounds, which is about uh, well, <laughs> two and a half million pounds, uh, Hong Kong dollars, uh, and this again, uh, and, and indeed to uh, five, uh, five, a fine of 5% of its turnover. So this again, I suggest, is an area uh, requiring urgent action in Hong Kong, and I would urge Mr. Cheung, uh, as chairman, to instruct his commission's working group on research, which has also been established since uh, 1st of June, to examine this problem. If, as seems likely, large numbers of children are in fact accessing adult websites, he will need to press the government to protect them by insisting that online providers adopt age verification techniques here, and this should be supported by criminal sanctions. Now, adult websites apart, uh, the Commission will also need to take, I suggest, a long, hard look more generally at child protection online. In other places, research has shown that paedophiles regularly groom, groom youngsters online, and this undoubtedly also happens here. Just last Monday, the British Foreign Secretary, uh, Sajid Javid, revealed that in the UK there are up to 80,000 people uh, assessed as posing some kind of uh, sexual threat to children online. And it would be naive, I suggest, to suppose that such people are not also active here. After it became illegal to send a sexual message to a child uh, in Britain, there were over 3,000 offences in the first year. And there can be no doubt that groomers everywhere are using social networks to contact children. The challenge, therefore, is to try to ensure that children are as safe online as they are when they walk on the streets. So a comprehensive strategy is now required and there needs to be a coordinated approach that connects schools, parents and social media providers backed up by tough laws. In the United States, for example, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, known as the COPPA, imposes requirements on website operators whose online services are directed to children or else collect information on children. Uh, this is uh, an example of the type of legislation which the Commission will need to examine if it is going to look at the means of promoting child safety uh, online. Now, cyberspace apart, uh, full checks are, I believe, necessary for those who are allowed to have access to children, uh, and these need to be far more stringent than those that are currently in place. Although it is true that the Security Bureau introduced its sexual conviction record check in 2001, which is an administrative measure uh, enabling uh, employers to ascertain if applicants for child-related work have previous sexual convi convictions, the scheme is voluntary, uh, and checks are only possible if the applicant consents. Moreover, although the scheme uh, covers teachers, social workers, paediatricians, librarians, school cleaners, 
uh, and school bus drivers. Uh, it does not include volunteers or private tutors, which has prompted concerns uh, in the judiciary and elsewhere. The existing scheme only provides minimal protection and much more is required. In the United Kingdom, for example, a child sex offenders disclosure scheme was introduced in 2011, and this enables any concerned member of the public to formally check uh, if someone has a record for child sexual offences, uh, although or disclosure is, is discretionary. Third parties, such as uh, neighbours or grandparents, may also seek information about an individual, although the police will only make a disclosure to parents or, or guardians, or those best placed to protect a child. The police, moreover, uh, have the power to notify on a confidential basis head teachers, doctors, youth leaders, sports club managers, and even landlords that a convicted sex offender uh, is, in the, is in the area. Offenders are required to inform the police uh, if they change address, leave home for over seven days, or go abroad. High-risk uh, offenders are subject to extra controls, including surveillance, supervised accommodation, uh, and even electronic tagging. These type of protections, however, are all lacking in Hong Kong, and this again places children at risk. I hope, therefore, that the new Commission, to show its worth, will review the situation uh, and produce some recommendations to the Security Bureau for more thorough checking arrangements uh, for those who have dealings with children uh, in whatever capacity. Next, may I say something about uh, corporal punishment. Now, as many of you will know, in 2013, the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child urged the prohibition by law of corporal punishment in all situations. Now, although corporal punishment is already banned uh, here in schools, in childcare centres, and in correctional institutions, it remains lawful in homes uh, where it is uh, widely used. Indeed, a recent study by the Caritas Youth and Community Service discovered that almost 63% of children uh, had been struck by their parents in the previous uh, 12 months, and of these, 31.3% described having received punishment that was categorized as physical abuse. Of greatest concern, perhaps, was the revelation that about 14.5% of the children surveyed had been seriously abused, abused by repeated beatings and the deliberate infliction of pain, sometimes with a stick, a belt, or some other hard object. Now, quite apart from physical harm, corporal punishment inevitably demeans the child uh, and can cause psychological damage and I suggest it has no place uh, in our society. There are surely alternative means uh, of dealing with children who misbehave, including reprimands, withdrawal of privileges, uh, and, curf and also curfews, which uh, can all be salutary, and I'm sure there are other measures, measures too. Now, again, the Commission must be prepared to speak uh, for the, ch for the ch children of Hong Kong on this and to ensure that Hong Kong fulfills its international obligations to adequately protect the child from abuse, abuse uh, of whatever sort. Turning before concluding to the age of criminal uh, responsibility, uh, in Hong Kong the age is uh, only 10, and this means that uh, pre-teens with no real appreciation uh, of uh, courts or crime can be prosecuted. In mainland China, uh, however, uh, children are criminally liable at 16 although for some offences, such as intentional homicide, the age is 14. In Macau, the other special administrative region, children under 16 are exempt from prosecution, although a special protection scheme exists for dealing with young offenders aged 12 or above. In Taiwan, a child below 14 is not criminally liable, although a young offender may face rehabilitative training. I would suggest that the age of criminal responsibility needs revision here in Hong Kong, perhaps to 12, uh, as in Canada, uh, the Netherlands and Scotland, uh, as children must be shielded from prosecution wherever this is possible. But where is their voice? Well, now they have one, and we must all hope that the Commission will take up this issue uh, and campaign for change. Now, in conclusion... I believe that if children are to achieve their rights in full, significant reform of the criminal law in many areas is vital. It has, as I hope is clear from what I've said, not moved with the times, uh, and developments, positive developments elsewhere in the world have simply passed Hong Kong by. The Commission of Chil on Children is now their champion, 
and it must be an engine for change. In the quest for better criminal justice, the Commission must be prepared to shout from the rooftops and to do all it possibly can to galvanise the government into much-needed reform. We must wish Mr Chung, Mr Law uh, and all their colleagues in the Commission well, but at the same time they need to understand that our expectations of them are very high. Their challenges may well be great, but in the words of Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible until it is done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Cross. Now we will have our second plenary session, applying Article 3 of the UNCRC in practice, Child Rights Impact Assessment and Lessons from International Best Practice by Professor Kapai. Professor Kapai, please. I'm very grateful to follow both our morning speakers, and particularly uh, for Mr. Cross's presentation, uh, given the broad coverage of the range of areas um, and such detailed consideration of the law and the statistics and how they beckon for an urgent uh, review and urgent action on the part of all those who have the power to influence change uh, speedily. It greatly also helps put into context what I'm about to share with you, which is more theoretical, uh, but also very principled uh, by drawing on sort of the underlying framework of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, but I hope that all these figures and the themes that Professor Cross has outlined will sort of hark back to you as I talk about the best interest principle and also the child rights impact assessment framework, because you always need to know, well, what am I applying it to so that we can test it and whether it's relevant, does it make sense? So I'm really, really grateful. Um, to follow that. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to explain a little bit about the background um, uh, of this research. So it's been wonderful to partner on this with PLAN, um, given their commitment to this work. And as many of you know, PLAN focuses on uh, specifically combating violence against children. And, you know, when we were brainstorming what should sort of this project be when it concerns sort of children, there's such an array of work that uh, does need to be done. Uh, but we were in agreement that we really have to go to the heart uh, of the issue and ask ourselves, well, why isn't the needle moving in Hong Kong? What is the challenge that practitioners um, and, and judges uh, and other adults who are engaging in, in work with children face when they have to uh, look for assistance to coordinate and ensure that children are properly protected and that harm is preventable before there's a need to sort of redress it. So in that sense, it's really been critical uh, to have this partnership and alliance with PLAN to be able to focus on um, the child rights impact assessment framework. And I think as we've worked through it over these months, it really um, has helped to um, expose sort of the framework to multidisciplinary professionals and to be able to workshop these ideas. And with PLAN support, I hope in the coming months to work with all of you to upscale or sort of ensure the uptake of this framework if it's considered uh, helpful. So what we um, did was uh, we reviewed um, four jurisdictions um, to understand and assess sort of how well placed they are in terms of their implementation of their human rights obligations under the Children's Rights Convention. And it, this sort of touches on Ms. Cartland's question. We, we sort of tried to pick jurisdictions which uh, not only bear relevance for Hong Kong in terms of good examples, but also are sort of um, economically close to the jurisdiction um, so that uh, we can consider issues of budgeting and resources uh, and also sort of legal um, framework should be sort of similar enough to be able to draw on on sort of those best practices from the countries concerned. So we drew primarily on Norway, um, England and Wales, and Australia. We looked at New South Wales particularly and Singapore. And as many of you know, right, um, for both England and Wales, there are, uh, there's a common law sort of practice, and Hong Kong system is predominantly based on the um, uh, system in, in, uh, in the UK, and so there's legislative um, provisions, which we still have, but UK sort of moved on. Um, and then in Australia, we often look to uh, legislative provisions there uh, as they um, do tend to lead in certain areas of law. Norway we picked because it's one of the first jurisdictions in the world to have a children's ombudsman um, and to, in fact, even have um, 
some of the uh, principles implemented in practice that we're talking about today. And Singapore, we felt, was jurisdictionally close enough culturally, economically, um, and in the region to be able to see, well, what is it doing differently, uh, if anything, and are there any lessons to sort of be gained there? Um, the, a the other aspect um, that the methodology comprised of was looking at the concluding observations and the state party reports to the UNCRC to see what are their legislation, uh, what are the legislative provisions, what is the framework for the protection of children's rights and interests, what are some of the policies which specifically mention the principles um, or reflect the principles um, in the CRC, and then how are these applied as far as we can tell in terms of case law or any other sort of secondary material uh, in the jurisdiction that reflects on this implementation. And then we looked at the most recent concluding observations of the country's concern to see what additional work the government has been asked to do by the members of the committee. So um, the idea was really to try to distill some of the best practices if they were being called out by the committee itself, or what are the areas for room for improvement even when some countries have made some strides um, and what are the thematic concerns which we found regularly appearing across a range of concluding observations for different jurisdictions um, that were the subject of the study uh, so that we could sort of um, identify two or three core themes